it must be a f interesting uh, thing to have basically have a co byline with Pope Francis. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. My husband said not too many academics get to list the Pope as a co author. Um, so that was great. Um, yeah, it was um, shocking and wonderful and uh, worrisome when I got asked to do it. It felt like a pretty big responsibility to do justice to this, you know, very significant document. And I had exactly eight days in which to do it. But I think, it, I think in a way it helped because I just dropped everything and I just focused on it. I read the encyclical once, I read it a second time, I read it a third time. And then I just sat down and without making a lot of complicated notes, just said to myself, what do I feel is the most important message here? And that, that's kind of how I managed to write an introduction in eight days. And I don't know, I feel, I, feel, I feel it worked. I'm happy with it, but I guess readers will judge. I think you and I both know that Climate change has never been just about the climate. And one reason this issue has always been tricky and complex is because it came to our attention initially as a scientific question, because it was scientists who first recognized that greenhouse gases could change the atmosphere in ways that would be consequential. But it's always been an issue that mattered because of its social and economic and political ramifications. And that's partly why it's always been a difficult issue. It's partly why scientists have had trouble communicating about it. And it's partly why the world has had trouble accepting the science, because we don't all like its po political implications. So one of the things that makes this document so important, I think, is that the Pope takes that on head on. And he says climate change isn't just about the climate. In fact, on some level, it's not even really about the climate at all, because if the climate just changed and that didn't affect people, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. It matters because of its impacts on people. But also, he says, and I th think this was a bold and important thing, because of its effects on all creation. So the Pope adamantly rejects the dichotomy, you know, people versus the planet or people versus plants and animals um, and says, no, that's a false dichotomy. It's all one, the planet, the people on it, the plants and animals, all of the interlocking, you know, what scientists would say, the e ecosystems, these are all interconnected. And for the Pope, the answer to that, I mean, for scientists, the answer is because we're all part of an ecosystem. But for the Pope, the answer is because it's all God's work. To me, the, the biggest value was simply him reminding us that um, science basically lays out the landscape, but the choices we make are a function of values, whether, you, whether it's religious or some other uh, route to the values. And you get at that a little bit in your, in your forward as well. Right. This is a really tricky issue, and I've actually been doing some work trying to parse this out in a more helpful way because... As you just said, the science tells us what's happening, but what we do about it is not essentially a scientific question. It's a moral, political, economic, and social question. But at the same time, some scientists react to that by saying, okay, I'm a scientist. I can't recommend any action. I can just say, and, and I think that's wrong too. I think that goes too far the other way. There are things that scientists understand about the problem, about the drivers, about the rate at which change is happening that do have very, very significant policy implications. And it's really important for scientists to talk to us about those aspects of the problem. And certainly to the extent that science tells us what the causes are, and to the extent that any remedy to be effective has to address the causes, um, the science is part and part of the policy response. And I don't think you can just say, oh, they're completely separate and unrelated. But at the same time, as I know you, you agree, there is, a, there is a dimension of the problem that's fundamentally not scientific. And that's the moral, political, economic, and I think the Pope would say spiritual aspect of it. And for me, this is really an important moment because I do think there's a profound spiritual aspect because it's also about, this is about the quality of our lives. And I don't just mean quality in a sort of economic sense of how much money we make, but you know, a deep, deep sense of what is it that makes life worth living? Why is beauty an important part of our lives? And the encyclical gets at that because it's saying, you know, even if we could live in a biosphere that was technologically controlled and had the oxygen and the food we needed, that would be an impoverished life. And I feel like that's a really important message because I feel like I feel that many people don't actually get that. And they don't actually understand, you know, there's the famous Joni Mitchell song where she says, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And I feel like that's happening around us. Like the idea that monarch butterflies that used to be like ordinary and taken for granted are now threatened with extinction is to me really shocking. And in a way, this was the message of Rachel Carson, too. Rachel Carson asked us to think, what would it be like to live in a world where you wake up in the morning and you don't hear any birds sing? Now, many New Yorkers, of course, 
live that life already and not to criticize New York, many great things about urban environments. But we've already lost a lot, but we're, in many ways we don't even realize it because it's a kind of death of a thousand cuts. So again, the Pope is basically saying to us, there is a lot of value in the natural world and it's, it's economic and it's um, practical and utilitarian, but it's also moral and spiritual and personal. And he's asking us to think about that aspect. And for me, that was very moving because scientists have a really hard time with that. You know, right. scientists can talk about the ecosystem services that butterflies offer and the role of pollinators. But, you know, the reality is most people are not moved by ecosystem services. Most people don't even know what that means. Right. But if you say, you know, butterflies are beautiful, or if you say, you know, it, well, I mean, obviously pollinators are incredibly economically important, hugely economically important, and that's important to communicate. But even if pollinators didn't pollinate the food we ate, you'd still want to live in a world with bees and butterflies. And I think that's what the Pope is saying to us. And that's a message I resonate with very, very strongly as a person with, you know, a foot in both the humanistic and the scientific camp. Well, it is an incredibly comprehensive document. It's amazing. I mean, he does talk about just about everything under the sun. And of course, he, you know, you're not, no one's going to agree with him about everything. Uh, but I feel like if I've learned one thing in my middle age is that you don't have to agree with everything that a person says to work with them or even be their friend. And I feel like we sometimes lose sight of that in American society these days. Yeah. So it doesn't trouble me that there are things in the document that I might have parsed a different way. So I will say on the family planning thing, um, my views on this might be a little different than yours. A lot of climate scientists end talks about climate with population. And I've always felt that that's a bit of a non sequitur, frankly, because the problem is not population, it's consumption. And the reality is, you know, as well as anybody, the places in the world that have the highest rates of population growth are generally not the same as the places that have the heaviest carbon footprints. Now, that's not to say that population growth isn't a problem in other significant ways with respect to water and quality of life. So I definitely agree that, you know, my views on population are different than the Pope's. Um, and I certainly, as a feminist, I have certain views about, you know, the empowerment of women that are probably right. not the same as the Pope's. But nevertheless, I still think that the focus on consumption, you know, is correct. In terms of its relation to capitalism, the document is complicated. And, and I have not been invited to sit down with the Pope and have a chat over tea about his views on capitalism. So I'm not quite actually sure how far he's pushing this argument. But I think that some people have misinterpreted it. I mean... I think it's quite clear, and given his background, I think it's obvious that he recognizes the failures of Marxism, he recognizes the failures of communism. I'm sure he was greatly influenced by the thinking of our previous Polish Pope. And he's obviously also not embracing liberation theology. I mean, he had the opportunity to do that coming from Argentina, and it's very conspicuous that he does not do that. So I think he's actually making it quite clear that he's not saying that we have to abandon capitalism. But he's saying we have to rethink certain assumptions. And I guess, um, you know, I, I think Naomi Klein is a brilliant writer and there's tons to really like and admire in her work. But I think where I would depart from that is to talk about capitalism, in my opinion, is like talking about religion, right? right? There are many different forms of capitalism during the course of history. And I feel that we've lost sight, actually, um, about that really important point. Um, so this is really about certain assumptions that have dominated the world in the last 30 years, I think, I would say. And this is what I tried to bring out in the introduction. We've made certain assumptions about the role of the marketplace and about how effective the market can be in solving a whole variety of different kinds of problems, including some that people didn't used to think in the past it could solve. So, you know, the whole idea of Pigovian taxes, pollution tax, this is an old idea. Economists recognized 100 years ago the problem of external costs, and that you can't rely on the magic of the marketplace to solve certain kinds of problems that are not manifested in the price of those goods and services. We've known this for a long time. I just came from the archives yesterday where people were talking about pollution taxes in the 1960s. So the idea that we need to do something to remedy market failure is an old idea. But yet somehow in the last 30 years, we sort of lost sight of that. And we've bought into a really um, aggressive and I would say dogmatic vision of capitalism and the role of markets. And so when the Pope talks in the encyclical about the deified market, I think he's right. I think he really hit on something very, very central, that for a lot of people, and I've just come back from the World Economic Forum in China, um, for a lot of people, this idea that the market will solve all problems if we just let it do its thing, 
has really become a kind of article of faith. You, you wrote a very creative uh, book um, this past mm -hmm. year um, that's essentially a future history, right. uh, sort of a, a projected history of what happens next. And now if you added into that the, uh, what the Pope has done um, this year and what, you know, with what's happening in Paris, uh, do you see this as, as, in the end, mattering much? What, what's the mm -hmm. biggest potential this Pope could have? I wrote this piece in June called Beware Casting Pope Francis as a Caped Climate Crusader. Mm -hmm. In other right. words, uh, inflated expectations. Just give your your final sense of, of how this could play out. Um, what's the best possible outcome? And in the long picture, does it matter? Right. Well, as you know, that's a really tough question. And I agree with you. I think a lot of scientists have been sort of hoping for the Pope to be the savior, which is ironic beyond belief. <laughs> I mean, the irony of this is actually amazingly delicious of a bunch of scientists, you know, looking to the Pope to save them. Uh, you know, so it's interesting or to save us, to save the whole world. Um, I guess my best case scenario, my dream scenario runs like this. The Pope speaks out and a whole lot of people who maybe haven't really been paying attention to this issue start paying attention. Because again, as you know, as well as I do, for you and me and the people we talk to, this is like so central and we live and breathe and sleep it. But the reality is there's, you know, hundreds of millions of our fellow Americans who really are not paying that much attention. So my dream scenario is that all these people start to pay attention. And when they hear it coming from the Pope, they realize, oh my God, this really is serious. And it's not just about polar bears, it's about us. And it's about, and it's related to inequality. And it's related to the whole question of why some people have, you know, huge amounts and other people have nothing. And, you know, that these things are related. Because you'll hear, you know, again, you hear people say, well, you know, you know the polls, the polls that ask people, what do you think are the three most important issues? And the environment never comes to the top, even though many people do care about the environment, very few people see it as more important than justice or prosperity or equality. But if people see them as linked, then suddenly the environment, instead of being kind of down here on number nine or 10, linked to justice and equality, suddenly emerges as kind of central. That seems like that could change the conversation then link into that the idea that some key Republicans, you know, that, were, that, I mean, again, if you watch the debate, look, we both know these people are not stupid. Some of them are ignorant, but they're not stupid. Um, I can't believe that the majority of Republicans in Congress in Washington don't realize that this is not a liberal hoax, right? <laughs> you know, and that this didn't begin with, you know, Tyndall in Ireland 150 years ago. But they've kind of backed themselves into a corner yeah. And everyone, anyone who knows anything about negotiations knows you always need to kind of figure out a way. What is, what is the way out for people who are back into a corner? So I guess my dream scenario hope was that the Pope offers a way out. It offers a way for people who have been in denial about climate, maybe especially someone like Rick Santorum, who was a practicing Catholic, or John Boehner, with some important influential Catholics in American politics, that this becomes an opportunity for them to say, oh, wow, I didn't quite get this. You know, now the Pope has put in a new light and you could begin to talk about it and, you know, maybe they'll never admit that Revkin and Oreskes were right all along, but that's okay, you know, we don't, have to, we, don't, we don't have to rub their noses in it, right? That they would see this as a way out. The public conversation begins to change and then, okay, here's where history does give you hope. We both know that sometimes things can change quite quickly when the cultural momentum is behind it. So that's the positive scenario, a new conversation that gets people like Rick Santorum involved, links the environment to key issues like justice and equality, changes the conversation, and then we pass meaningful action to really do something about the problem. And I do think that the United States, you know, for all our difficulties right now, this is still an incredibly powerful and, um, what's the word I want, a country with huge capacity, right? We still have enormous scientific engineering social capacity. So if we were to really make our minds up to do something about this, I actually believe we could. I don't think it's too late in that sense. My worst case scenario, you already know because you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> all right, great. This has been very helpful and um, I look forward to, we'll just have to check back in five years and see how it all plays out.